Shabbat Shalom, friends. Thank you so much for your kind attention and for your enthusiasm. Look before you leap. She who hesitates is lost. Slow and steady wins the race. Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Whenever I'm on the threshold of another seemingly major life decision, these famous and conflicting words of wisdom often engage in a battle royale in my mind and heart. Which way to go? How do we dive into life's challenges and opportunities without getting burned? Our Torah portion from Leviticus and its accompanying Haftarah, that incredible Haftarah from 2 Samuel, paint unusually parallel portraits. These are really matched gorgeously of the dangers that can befall even the most well-meaning people when they leap before they look. Enthusiasm is a favorite topic for Shmini, for this section of Leviticus and its matching section from 2 Samuel. Rabbi Sachs of Deeply Blessed Memory also wrote for this week about Shmini and about enthusiasm. And he shares that, of course, enthusiasm is generally seen as positive. One dictionary defines it as a feeling of energetic interest in a particular subject or activity and an eagerness to be involved in it. He wrote, people with enthusiasm have passion, zest, excitement, and this can be contagious. It's one of the gifts of a great teacher or leader. People follow people of passion. If you want to influence others, cultivate enthusiasm. But he also teaches that the word did not always have a favorable connotation. In fact, originally in English, it referred to someone possessed by a spirit or a demon. In 17th century England, it came to refer to extreme and revolutionary Protestant sects, and more generally, to the Puritans who fought the English Civil War. Enthusiasm became a synonym for religious extremism, zealotry, and fanaticism. Enthusiasm was considered irrational, volatile, and dangerous. Scottish philosopher David Hume wrote that the corruption of the best things produces the worst, and that that was especially true of religion. David Hume wrote, there were two ways in which religion can go wrong, through superstition and through enthusiasm. Superstition is driven by fear, irrational anxieties and terrors, and we deal with them by resorting to very often irrational remedies. But enthusiasm is the opposite. It's the result of overconfidence. The enthusiast in a state of high religious rapture comes to believe that he is being inspired by God himself and is thus empowered to disregard reason and restraint. Hume wrote, enthusiasm thinks itself sufficiently qualified to approach the divinity without any human mediator. The enthusiast in its grip is so full of what he takes to be holy rapture that he feels entitled to override the rules by which priestly conduct is normally governed. There he strays into the fanatic. Hume wrote, the fanatic consecrates himself and bestows on his or her own person a sacred character, far superior to whatever forms and ceremonial institutions can confer on any other. Rules and regulations, think the enthusiast, are for regular people, not for us. We, inspired by God, no better. And that, said Hume, can be very dangerous indeed. When the Israelites are consecrating the tabernacle, fire came forth from before the eternal and consumed the burnt offering. And the people saw and shouted and fell on their faces. Oh, so far, so good. The priestly rituals in the newly dedicated tabernacle seem to be working very well and according to plan. But then... Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, took their fire pan, put fire in it, and laid incense on it. And they each offered before the Eternal strange fire, which had not been enjoined upon them. And fire came forth from the Eternal and consumed them, and they died. 
The scene is nothing short of a four alarm fire, a conflagration indicated by the fact that the word fire appears four times in a very short space. Aish. It's a calamity, the origins of which the commentators have never determined with certainty. Nadav and Avihu were thought to have been acting outside the norm, the rules didn't apply to them, with their unbidden offering, flouting the barely established priestly order and literally playing with fire. Were they arrogant, disdainful of the elders whom they imagined replacing? Did they not take wives? That's one option, several options. Or were they swept up in a current of zealousness that, as often happens, led to unintended and disastrous consequences? And then in 2 Samuel, we have another moment of high ceremony. In around the year 1000 BC, King David brings the Ark of the Covenant toward Jerusalem amid great pomp and pageantry to establish the holy city as the religious hub of the emerging nation. But then, the oxen nearly upset the cart carrying the Ark, and Uzzah, son of Aminadab, in whose keeping the Ark had been, reached out for and seized hold of the Ark of God. The Eternal grew furious with Uzzah, and God struck him down on the spot because of his disrespect or error. There he died next to the Ark of God. We have a little more explanation for this tragedy compared to the incredibly mysterious Leviticus story, but we are still left with a mighty puzzle. Uzzah's instincts appear innocent and correct. He's protecting the Ark from danger. Yet another son of a high-ranking man dies after coming too close to divine power. And like the onlookers, we are left shaken and distressed. The reactions of the leaders are fascinating in both accounts. Moses springs into somewhat frenetic and military-like action. Aaron is famously silent. And David is so terrified by what happens to Uzzah, he won't go near the ark for months. That may be an integral point of these stories, that human dignitaries get grave, heart-stopping, tragic warnings about the tendency among those with power to overreach and, like Hume wrote, imagine themselves on a level with God. And that the victims in these legends are the sons of important men also suggests that crises of succession ensue when egos run wild among those charged with the greatest and most delicate of responsibilities. Both stories are checks on the potential of powerful people to fly too close to the sun. Those of you who engage in the practice of Musar, a transformative Jewish spiritual study based on classic Jewish texts, Musar identifies primary aspects of our personalities. They're called soul traits, in Hebrew, midot, and those can increase self-awareness and restore harmony to your inner life and your relationships. I invite you to give it a try. The stories of Nadav, Avihu, and Uzzah offer examples of the soul trait called zrizut. It's a great word. Try it out on your tongue. Zrizut. <laughs> Most of us could benefit greatly from an infusion of zrizut in our work, our studies, our building connections, and our proactivity in helping with tikkun olam, repair of the world, and tikkun hanefesh, repair of the souls. Now, most of the teachings on zrizut, and we struggle to define it, alacrity, uh, zest, enthusiasm, zealousness, uh, hurrying, it's hard to translate, just as so many of them do. All of them do, they work better in Hebrew. So just stick with zrizut, and it'll lead you down the right path. Most of the teachings on zrizut say, he who hesitates is lost. We're told to hurry to do mitzvot, fulfill the will of God, make best and efficient use of our days on earth, to live as fully and as righteously as we can. An older, beloved teaching on zeal, on zrizut, comes from Proverbs, chapter 6, where we are told, look to the ant, A-N-T. Study its ways and learn. Without leaders, officers, or rulers, it lays up its stores during the summer, gathers up its food at the harvest. To bolster zrizut, we should be like the tiny, immensely strong ant, whose alacrity for performing life's tasks is really Remarkable. Side note on ants and Passover. Years ago, we had, as one is wont to do, dropped a bunch of matzah crumbs the night of the Seder on the floor. 
first night Seder. Second night Seder, we went to family, and we had yet to fully clean up. It was still holiday, and we left the matzah crumbs there. We returned after the second night Seder to see the crumbs of matzah marching across the floor. A colony of ants had discovered them and were carrying them on their little tiny backs back to their house. I let them go as much as possible. It was a most remarkable scene. They were doing what God had put them there to do, help us giants clean up our mess. I'm fascinated by ants. What zrizut. But the passages from Leviticus and 2 Kings seem to warn very clearly against an excess of zrizut. In these stories, we have enthusiasm out of balance in three young men who pay with their lives when caution deserts them. Because Proverbs also teaches, the thoughts of the zealous are superfluous, and those who are hasty reap only loss. So again, which is it? Do we go for it or let it go? Leap first, ask questions later, or proceed with care, though the moment may pass us by. Zrizut in measured amounts is absolutely essential to achieving healing that we and the world so desperately need. But we are fairly warned. The fires of zealousness can erase the good intentions of enthusiasm, and experience alone will tell us where and whether we have crossed the line. Shabbat Shalom.